And this morning's session was very interesting. We had a very dynamic session with some phenomenal speakers this morning, um, looking at clonal evolution in CLL, which has always been um, a problem for us, particularly in our relapse refractory settings when we look at patients who uh, fail chemoimmunotherapy. And so the session looked at multiple um, uh, clonal and subclonal mutations that derive over time and some very elegant data that's been presented over time, um, looking at many mutations. And now that the landscape of treatment has changed as well, so we're moving away from chemoimmunotherapy, how has the new B-cell receptor agents and uh, other things like BCL2 inhibitors such as venetoclax, how has that affected the clonal mutations uh, or perhaps driver mutations in CLL over time? Uh, and it, obviously our data is a little bit more immature with the new therapies because we don't have that same length of time that we have for chemoimmunotherapy. Um, and we're seeing um, some uh, interesting findings that have emerged that are still suggesting that it's not necessarily that um, uh, uh, different mutations are necessarily present. Some are present prior to even starting certain treatments, so they were there initially. So whether patients got chemoimmunotherapy or have been exposed to a brutinib, those, those mutations might be there in low levels to begin with and then are driven out later. So I think this is still an evolving area um, that we will need to follow, particularly in the context of new clinical trials. And obviously, one of the proponents who spoke this morning was saying, well, if we get really, really good at what we're doing, and do things so finely and have precision medicine where you can obviously um, take sequential samples from our patients, we can look at their mutations and then make interactions on therapies along the way. Of course, that would be ideal for every cancer um, and hopefully that we could get to that because obviously um, doing that sort of, um, um, uh, having that sort of technology and being able to do that in real time would be wonderful. I mean, obviously what we're doing, because the field is moving so quickly, like much of cancer, the field moves so quickly that obviously getting that data from the clinical trials and uh, it sort of lags behind even some of the therapeutics that are emerging. So this is something that we have to keep part of uh, all the future clinical trials that we're doing in CLL, trying to get those samples, <clears throat> seeing if we can identify either driver mutations or other subclones that might emerge, or are we changing the type of mutations that are emerging based on how we're sequencing therapy? Therapies. So that's another major issue that we're going to be looking at, whether starting abrutinib first versus chemoimmunotherapy versus sequencing other oral agents along the way will change those mutations or frequency of mutations over time. So, so this is an emerging field. It was, a, it was actually um, a, a very exciting uh, session that we had this morning. So that was, that was pretty much a little bit of a summary of that session. One of the things we also focused on, we talked about Richter syndrome. And obviously this has been a conundrum uh, uh, for us um, from the get-go. Um, you know, it used to be that we focused initially on the poor risk prognosis with patients, the 17P, P53 deleted patients, and of course the Richters. And now with the newer therapies, thankfully, we've really salvaged and come a long way for patients with 17P and P53. But we have done, we have really haven't done much in the way of advancements or progress in patients who develop Richter syndrome. And so much of the eloquent data that was also presented this morning talked about were there differences in the uh, frequency of Richter's transformation that we see now um, from chemoimmunotherapy errors to now the oral, the, you know, the oral therapies, has the frequency changed? There was an initially a concern that when we um, started clinical trials with abrutinib and some of the oral um, B cell receptor agents and, and venetoclax that we saw an increase in frequency in Richter syndrome. Um, but I mind, everybody had to be mindful of the fact that those patients were mostly in the relapse refractory setting and they already had a lot of chemoimmunotherapy. So they were just starting these new agents and develop Richter's and there was a fear that those agents were driving that syndrome. And what we can see from you know now data that's been mounting for several years with the new agents, that the frequency really hasn't changed just because of the new agents. What we're trying to identify is whether or not um, there'll be a change of how those patients will respond um, to subsequent therapies if they're starting a, a novel agent first prior to chemoimmunotherapy. And, and unfortunately, our data still looks pretty poor. So even if you develop Richter syndrome and have been exposed to a brutinib or a novel agent first versus chemoimmunotherapy first, it's still a bad syndrome to, to, to have. Um, and our therapies are so lacking. Um, you know, we standardly give lymphoma-based therapies, and we haven't done a single thing. In other words, it's just terrible therapy. And all these patients should be on, should be on clinical trials. So I think the take-home message from this morning's session was that Richter's is still a very bad player. 
Um, we haven't really changed the frequency by the novel agent, so everybody should be at least reassured that that's probably not the case. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do with regards to trying to um, evaluate these patients, get tissue so that we can sort of study the tissue, their lymph node biology, which may be different, um, and then trying to get them on clinical trials or novel agents because traditional lymphoma-based therapy does not work for these folks. And so I think that was probably the only sad part of this morning's session was that uh, we still haven't done that much in the therapeutic there are some new agents. John Bird had presented uh, some new uh, agents um, that, that are going to be looked at in phase one. Um, there was a recently publication on, on PD-1 inhibitors as well. So there are at least hopefully some trials now where this was an area that it was hard to get clinical trials running because, um, you know, Richter's syndrome is really only in about 5 to 15 percent uh, development, and so you have to really get many centers together to study these patients. Um, and so the, the take-home message is we have a long way to go for Richter's, but hopefully now we have some dedicated clinical trial development for this now, you know, sort of unmet need in CLL, which is Richter's.